praise God, it is so good to come back and share the good news of Jesus Christ with you. Thank you for you that are joining us already. And let me just look here and see if I can find who is there with us already. Uh, we're just so glad to have you to be a part of uh, our ministry. Uh, we're just expecting something good to happen. Tonight's going to be a very special broadcast because I have a really special guest with me tonight that I'll be talking to you about in just a minute. I say Judy Baldwin, Susan Hall, Samuel, Alicia, um, Tammy, our daughter, and many others are joining us. Um, many others are joining us, and uh, we're just so grateful for you, Cliff Cook. We're glad to see you. And we just pray that God's blessings will be upon each one of you as you watch this evening. God is so good. Everybody just say, God is so good. God, God is so good. good. Amen. Yes. Well, you know, it takes me a minute or two to get acclimated because I got my people here I'm watching on my cast, and then I got the ones I'm watching here on uh, Facebook. So uh, just bear with me, and I'll get it all together real soon. <laughs> And it's good to see you that are watching. Good to see you, Shirley. Um, and as you join on, I want you to just open your heart and get ready because we're going to be talking about some things tonight that I believe if you will let God, he will help you and heal you everywhere you hurt. Good evening to you, Sally. It's always good to see you, Susan. Uh, you're watching from High Springs and Mike. Uh, over in Georgia. It's good to see you too. Anyway, I got to get on with the broadcast, so why don't we pray right now and just ask God's blessings to be here with us tonight and right where you are. Father, I'm so grateful tonight for this privilege, for this opportunity that you give us each Tuesday night to join with people in the United States, Canada, and different parts of the world we talk about the goodness of God. We go to your word and share your word. We talk about our personal experience. And in our personal experience, how you come to us and you help us when we are in our time of need. So I pray each person tonight that is viewing or will watch this later, somehow they'll take the ministry time that we share and the word of God that we share to apply it to their life so that they can walk through whatever it is walking through and come through a better person. And I thank you, God, that you're going to touch many lives tonight. In Jesus' precious name, amen. 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 Arcella Rodriguez, it's so good to see you. And I just pray God blesses you too. Anyway, we're going to get started here. And as I said, I have a very, very special guest. Hey, Flame, it's so good to see you, Flame. Uh, uh, and I, my special guest this evening is someone I've known for quite a while. <laughs> uh, actually, I met her in Niagara Falls, Ontario, Canada, over 56 years ago, and I was so awestruck by her that uh, uh, when I left, I took her with me, and she's been with me forever. That's my wife, Sharon Clowers. And I'm so glad that she is with me tonight. She's my best friend. She's my wife. She's the mother of my children, the grandmother of our children, grandchildren. And so I just uh, am so grateful to have my wife sitting here with me this evening. And we're going to talk about some things that we've been through, talk about the Word of God, and show you if God can bring us through our times of difficulty, He can bring you through too. So I want to welcome this evening my lovely wife, Sharon Clowers. Well, it's good to be here. I know I usually am at home with our granddaughter um, while you are here, but it's a privilege to be here tonight and to be on the set with you. And I believe it's going to be a good night. And we by no means are an expert, but we are going to share with you what we've been through and how we came through the storms of life and, and it was by the grace of God that we came through. Uh, just because we're in the ministry, we're not eliminated from pain. And we are going to share a little bit of that with you tonight of how we overcame our pain 
and trials in life and just know that you can do the same. You can get through whatever you're going through tonight. We're going to be talking about loss of a loved one, but you know, you may be experience the loss of a job, the loss of your home. Loss encompasses so much, but if you take the Word of God, you are able to get through the loss and come out on top with the help of Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, we believe that with all of our heart, that God will help you. You know, life has so many hurts and disappointments, and that's one reason that I am so glad that I have Jesus living in my heart and in my life. You know, I really don't know, Sharon, what I would do um, if I didn't have the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, living in our heart. Well, you know, we've talked about that before and coming through some of the difficulties that we'll share is I don't know what people do when they don't have Jesus a part of their life and when He is not King of their life, how they get through circumstances and how they get through difficulties in life because knowing Jesus is what brought us through our difficulty. Well, you know, we started out fortunately on the right track and I remember that first night. Um, <laughs> we were just kids. We were just kids, you're exactly right. Um, and Richard Harper says my mic is not working. Um, so, Danielle, if my mic is not working, and then Pastor Sharon's mic's a little bit loud. Um, anyway, you out there in the audience, can you hear me okay? If you can't hear me okay, let me know. Uh, and I'll read right, are you on Facebook or are you on Livecast, either one if you're having a hard time hearing me, let me know. Uh, anyway, we were getting, I, I want to make sure you're hearing me. So, uh, <laughs> For sure. Maybe you want to talk to me. <laughs> Well, that uh, you talking about the first night. Yes. Yes, we were just kids and just, uh, we were married in Niagara Falls, Ontario, and just across the bridge into Buffalo, we got some cheap little hotel uh, to spend the night in. But uh, what we did that first night, we got down on our knees and uh, we made a covenant between each other and we made a covenant with God that we would always love God We'd always love each other, and we would always be a tither and a giver. And, you know, we've been tempted on all three. And, uh, but we have kept our covenant with God and kept our covenant with each other. And I thank God that we did because we have seen many blessings because we did keep our covenant that we made with each other. Well, I, I just look back and you know that was over 56 years ago or 56 yes. years ago a little over um, and still uh, is there enough volume now just okay um, because Judy just said not enough volume here but anyway I want to make sure that I you can hear me when I'm talking or if not I'll just let Sharon do all the talking <laughs> uh, anyway when we started, she talked about that first night we made our covenant with God and we were just kids. She was 17 and I was 19. You know, when you start on a journey, whoever you are, whether you're in ministry or whether, you, uh, whether you're single, whether you're married, it doesn't matter. Once you start your journey, you don't know what's going to be ahead in that journey. And that's what I always continually encourage people to do is um, know about Jesus Christ and let him help you because he will help you on your journey. Uh, I'm still, it says it sounds good now, okay. Anyway, Jesus will help you on your journey and that's, that's what we want to talk about tonight as we both have mentioned, without Christ, the things that we've been through, I don't know how we would have made it, and she just mentioned the covenant that we made with each other, uh, that we would always love God, we would always love each other, and we would always be a tither and a giver. Well, you know, it's easy to make promises. It's easy to say things. And a lot of people can say a lot of things, but you know, the follow through, mm -hmm. And, and, and doing things when the times are tough, 
that's when it really matters. In Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 2, when you pass through the waters, I think Pastor Al Rowan read this on the broadcast here, or the webcast here a few weeks ago, but when you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flames scorch you. You know, so in other words, it's not saying that uh, if things happen to you, it's saying when things happen to you. So God will walk through the fire. He will be with us through anything we go through. And you know, when you're going through the fire and you're going through the hard times, you know, that's, that's, when, that's when you really know whether you got faith or not. So if you don't go through things, you don't know if you got faith or not. But when you're going through tra trauma, bad times, difficult times, Satan is just seemingly hammering away at you. What do you do? What do you have the word for? The word is not just to read, but the word is to look back into and see what God did, even in the Old Testament and the New Testament, and see what God did for them and then we need to learn to apply it to our life. Well, if you said, Sharon, that uh, we have been tried and tested in all three, loving God, loving yes. each other, and the tithe and giving. There's well, been times that, uh, you know, we had had to be tested in those we things. We did. And, you know, in our uh, early ministry, um, you know, especially with our finances, we didn't have much. We were just starting out. And you may have or may not have shared that story in one of the uh, programs uh, when we didn't have any money at all, but uh, we didn't even have any money for milk for, uh, for David <laughs> and uh, for Tammy. I was pregnant with David and we had to end up pawning our watches, but the money that we received, we even tithed off of that. And uh, we just, it, it, in us, it felt like we were robbing if we didn't pay our tithe because we knew we made that covenant. And you know, something that my mother was a giver and my grandmother was a giver. And it tells us, you know, that our, our, our offspring will be blessed. And I believe that's why today that we are blessed, not just because we're in the ministry, but because we obeyed our covenant and kept our covenant that we would always be a tither, we would always be a giver. And because of that, and we were tested many times, it wasn't just that one time, uh, over the course of the span of our marriage, we've been tested many times and still are tested. That are you going to give because you have a small week this week? Are you gonna hold back your tithe? No, I'm not gonna hold back my tithe because I know as long as I stay true to the covenant that I made with Jesus Christ in giving my tithe and offerings that he will always come through for me. It may come at the 11th hour and you think you're praying, oh dear God, please come through for me. And it's like sometimes why does he wait till the 11th hour? But I think he just wants to see if we really are trusting him. And he does come through for us when we keep his word and his commandments and keep the covenant that you made with him. Well, you know, we didn't plan to get started talking about giving. No. <laughs> we were going to talk about tragedy to, from tragedy to triumph. But, you know, this is part of it, of what she's well, talking about. Because when we were in San Antonio, Texas, and what she just brought up, and we didn't have any money, and I have shared this, and I won't go over it again. But... Uh, that was a real trial for us, whether we would really <clears throat> believe the Lord or not. And you know, people watch us all the time, and, and, and I never want to say anything that'll make you feel bad. But you know, um, I can't help it what other ministers have done. You know, some people say, well, I've sown into ministers' life and they misused the money. Well, you know, I'm not other ministers. That's right. We're who we are. And I would never use that as an excuse not to tithe and to give because of what other ministers have done. Well, you even said Sunday, those that have misused, they are the ones going to be held accountable. But we give from our heart 
that we are sowing to God, not to the person, but we're sowing to God. And so we are going to reap a harvest, but that person has to give account if they're not doing right. Exactly. And so that's what we always try to realize. And she, she said just a few minutes ago, some people said, well, I don't have enough. Well, you know, the, the Bible didn't say that. The Bible said for us to give a tenth, or it says to give liberally, or as a man purposes in his heart to give. And then when you, when you give, because the giver's inside of you. See, God gave his son for us to have eternal life. And so when he comes in us, there's no greater giver. And we don't give because we have to. But I was just remembering one of the, um, uh, one of the tra traumatic times mm -hmm. of when our daughter was hit by the car. And um, that was a very trying time. Very trying time. Uh, I'll, I'll have you talk about that in just a minute, but I was in Fort Worth and then I had to fly home because we lived in Chattanooga, Tennessee mm -hmm. at the time. But during the, during the hospital time, uh, I had to stop all my meetings because this was a, a long yeah. time. You were without meetings for weeks. Weeks, I was without meetings and I had no income coming in. And, uh, and I'm talking about ministry-wise, and I had staff, too, to yeah. pay. Ministry time and, and no money personally. And, and, um, and, you know, this was a trying time for what little money we did have. And I'll never forget, as I said, it was weeks and Tammy was in the hospital. And so we was there every day and every night. And uh, thank you, Carolyn. Uh, we should want to pay our tithes and give offerings. And that's part of it. And that's what, what we're talking about here is um, during our time of trauma, when Tammy was in the hospital, and I remember, I have told this story before, but I went home for a shower, and I come back, and there was a guy in the hospital, and I really didn't like him. Um, <laughs> he was hard to like. <laughs> he was hard to like, wasn't he? He really was. Oh, I mean, you know, he just smoked one cigarette <laughs> after another, and, you know, he just said every other word, or probably every two words were cuss words, and one word was a normal word. And his daughter was in the hospital, and they had five children. And so he said so many bad words, I just give him a nickname of Cusser. And uh, I remember I'd gone home to take a shower and you know, I didn't have a whole, we didn't have much money, it was all the money we had. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't remember if you was to the hospital, I don't remember where you were, but I remember going back to the hospital and the Lord said to me, he said, uh, give Cusser all your money. Some people said, did God actually call him Cusser? No, <laughs> God, didn't call, God didn't call him Cusser, but that was the impression that came to me. And I thought, well, Lord, why would you want me to give him all my money? And uh, when you know our situation here, I, we've been in the hospital now with Tammy for days and weeks. and and uh, But anyway, he had five children, and then they was expecting one, and his daughter yes. was in intensive care, mm -hmm. too. Same I, kind of injury as our daughter. Same kind of injury as our daughter. And um, I remember walking in, and when I walked in, who did I see first? I saw Cusser. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I didn't wait any longer. I just reached in my pocket and got all my money and gave it to him. And uh, he just dropped down on his knees. And well, I told him, I said, I handed him the money and I said, um, God told me to give you this. And he said, what are you talking about? And I said, well, God told you to get me to give you this money. He said, well, what you, you, you're just like me, preacher. You ain't got no money either. <laughs> and that was the truth. I didn't have any money. <laughs> but I gave him what I had and he fell down on his knees and he began to cry. And he said, I've never had anybody to give me anything. And of course, my thoughts were, I could understand why <laughs> that you never had anybody to give you anything because of your attitude and your language. But I gave him that money and he, he received Jesus as his savior and God changed his life because yeah, I sowed a seed. And so you that help us in the ministry, thank you for the ones that do appreciate it. And you that haven't, I love you anyway. And wherever you go to church, make sure you tithe and you give. 
And uh, Tammy's medical bills were expensive. They were, and we had a lot of expense, mm -hmm. and we didn't have insurance. And um, uh, this was a very trying time. Yeah, it was. But, you know, uh, that started a chain of reactions, of blessings, when I sowed that seed. Mm -hmm. And that Sunday following, I don't remember what day that was. It was, I don't even remember the day, but I remember uh, Monday, not Sunday, but Monday following, I got a phone call because in the intensive care back in those yeah. days, if you remember, people couldn't come yeah, up there. Couldn't. And um, anyway, I answered the phone and, and uh, the, the pastor said to me, he's a friend of mine, he said, could you come down in the lobby? We've got seven, seven or eight pastors here that we want to see you. And so um, I went down and they handed me a, um, <clears throat> they handed me, handed me a package and in it, it had some on money and it was seven times Ten the times. amount that right. I gave old Cusser. Yeah. Well, it's because we didn't rob God of his tithe in offering him what belonged to him plus of what we had which was very little, and we gave it to another individual that needed something, but you, you were obedient to the voice of God, and so by being obedient, then God provided for us, and that's what happens when you're obedient to the voice of God in giving. And sometimes we want to argue within ourselves, say, but, oh, but God, I've got the late bill, but God, I have this and I have that. When you are obedient, God will always come through for you and cause you to rise to the top and will supply your every need. Well, you know, I say this all the time, Sharon, that um, God doesn't do for us because we're preachers and no. we're in the ministry, but because... We're just people. Of, well, and we had no way, I had no way that I, you know, what happened was uh, on Sunday before that Monday they brought the offering, in a service that Sunday night, a pastor got up and said, Don Clower's child has mm -hmm. been hit by the car and she's in serious condition and, and I don't know if they got any money or not and I think we ought to receive them an offering. Yeah. Well, they received this an offering and brought it to us and then of course, you know, I tithed out of that yeah. and I gave out of that and God continued to supply our need. But let me go back and then we got one more thing I want us to get into okay. real quickly. But I, I, I just feel like for some reason God had us to bring this up and to tell you that no matter how poor you think you are, how mm -hmm. little you think you are, you can't blame anything on not giving. Giving is the nature of God. So when you give of your tithe and your offerings, and if you're not, you're robbing yourself. You can't rob God and take the streets of gold down and you can't take the diamonds and you can't take the pearly gates. That's going to stay there whether you give or you don't give. But I want to encourage you that tithing and giving to God is something you want to do, not something you have to do. And we started 56 years ago doing this and we are still the same today. It's when God gives us something we realize 10% goes to God and then we have some left that we're going to give to God. We always want to do that because we know God is the one that blesses us and will open the windows of heaven and supply our needs. That's right. Now, I was in Fort Worth when this happened and you were in Chattanooga, Tennessee when our daughter got hit by the car. What was that first few minutes like? Oh my gosh, uh, that was so horrific. Uh, when uh, I went to uh, find her when she was hit by the car, you know, you hear they were across the street and then her little cousins come running in and said, Tammy's been hit by the car. At first I thought it was, was our dog and I didn't want to go out then, but then one of the uh, cousins came in and said, Tammy was hit by the car. Well, we got her rushed to the hospital and we had her, she was actually laying on my lap and her head was gashed open, she, her leg was gashed open and I, I just prayed in tongues because I didn't know what else to do because I saw this injured body just laying limp on my lap and then when... Now you left our other three kids. I left her other three kids, some of the older cousins were watching the three children as we rushed to the hospital. And then when we, they brought us to emergency, actually the policeman 
you know, put his sirens on and brought us right to the emergency room. And when we got there, they they just wouldn't let me go back there. And it was it was the longest time. It just seemed like it was just hours and hours. And then finally, uh, a doctor come out after I don't know how many times because I was kind of in a state of semi shock of having my daughter being hit so terribly by the car and not knowing if she's going to make it or not and just believing she was. And finally the doctor come out and he said, I don't know if she's going to make it to in the morning or not. And said she's uh, very serious. And so then that's when I called you. And uh, you were, I think it was right before your meeting and they paged you at the restaurant. You were having a cup of coffee and and they finally paged you and I said, you have to come home. Our daughter's been hit by a car and I don't know if she'll make it till you get home. And uh, so then I was waiting. You got home, I think, at two or three o'clock in the morning from Fort Worth. And while I was waiting, they wouldn't let me go back to see her. And that was terrifying in itself that I couldn't see my, see my daughter. And so finally, uh, after hours, they let me go back and they, you know, she was on oxygen, they had her bandaged up and um, they just kept giving me all these false reports that she was going to die, she was going to die, she was going to die. And I, and I said, Father, she didn't die at the scene, so you must have a purpose for her life. And so I believe she's going to be healed and she's going to recover. And then when you came in uh, early that morning and you saw her what a state that she was in, uh, I know it took you by surprise because by then her brain had swollen so much. Her head was, I guess, probably twice the size. It was, it, it had swollen so much. And uh, when you came in that morning and we just held hands. We went, I remember us going to uh, the, the chapel. Uh, I hadn't talked about it in a long time, so it just, I'm so thankful for my daughter. I just thank God every day for her. But I remember us going in the chapel and uh, praying for her that God was going to totally heal her. And so in coming through that, it, it has uh, given me so much compassion for people. It's not that I didn't have compassion for people, but it gave me such a passion for people that are believing for loved ones that are going through a situation, near death situations or just a healing that, that they need. It has given me a compassion because we have walked through the fire and God brought us through the fire and it's not easy going through the fire, going through that hard place. But when we put our trust in God, you see, I had to put my trust in God. You weren't there, so I couldn't put my trust in you. And so my only hope was putting my trust in God that he would bring my beautiful Tammy through. Well, you know, I've, uh, sometimes it's even hard to come back and say something after listening to her tell the story because when we first got married, Sharon was shy. She was an um, introvert. Um, trying to get her to talk was, um, it, it was almost an impossibility to get her to talk. But through these things that's happened to us, she has become, she became stronger and stronger. And now sometimes I think she's probably a stronger woman than I am a man. I don't know, it just watched her go through these things. And so, to tell you, God did, in time, totally heal our daughter Tammy, restored her when the doctors told us she was going to die, and then they said if she didn't die, they said she'll be a vegetable the rest of her life. Well, Tammy didn't die. She's not a vegetable, but she's alive and well, and she's watching the broadcast of the webcast right now. You know, when she was at the state where, you know, she uh, couldn't talk or anything and uh, she was still semi-conscious, uh, I'll never forget that morning. 
I was, she would rise early and just be awake. And uh, I would always get up early with her and put her head in my lap. And she still had a few of her, she has natural curly hair. And I always kept her hair so pretty with little ringlets. And uh, she, her fevers were so high, she had lost a lot of her hair. But I would stroke some of the hair that was still left. And uh, one morning I had, you know, some crazy little show, Dennis the Menace on, <laughs> that she always used to watch. And uh, it was about 6 a.m. in the morning and she was laying in my lap and I had Dennis the Menace on. Why? I don't know, but, but it was, it was on. <laughs> and all of a sudden she chuckled and that was the first sound we had heard in two months. And she chuckled and I got her head and raised it up and looked at her towards me. And I said, Tammy, say mama. And she said, Mama. And then that's when you came running in the room and her next word was Daddy. And uh, so, you know, it, it wasn't instantly overnight, but it was a gradual progression of her healing. And did we have some setbacks? Yes, there were some setbacks, but we kept standing on the word. And uh, even several years after her healing, she had a setback and the devil wanted to talk in my ear and say, see, the doctor said this would happen. But we put it down and said, no, we don't accept this. This is not what we're going to live with. She is healed. Well, the thing of it was, um, those were days, weeks, and months. Mm -hmm. And I remember, you know, that you just said, I had started back ministering because we had Tammy at home and this was weeks after now and she was still, as she said, semi-conscious and um, couldn't speak, couldn't talk, could, couldn't communicate and still couldn't control her body functions. And, um, but that was the first real signs of her breakthrough of being able to speak. And so I had been to Memphis speaking the night before, and I think I had driven back from Memphis, yeah, which was did. about a five or mm -hmm. six hour drive and didn't get in till four or five o'clock in the morning. And uh, when I heard this conversation going <laughs> on and I heard her whisper out, Mama, I mean, obviously I jumped up and ran in and I wanted to get in on the conversation and, and make sure she recognized her daddy. <laughs> and, and she did. Uh, <laughs> And Richard Harper is asking, what about the person who hit her? Well, uh, she was a nice lady. Um, Very sorry. Uh, she was sad. She was hurt. She was um, broken. Um, she had just, come to the hospital, and I don't remember, you know, to this day what she looks like, but she, um, We were you know, nice to her. We were nice to her, and it was one of those things where, Tammy was holding on to her cousin's hands and she darted across, she let go and darted across the road and it wasn't the woman's fault and um, it was it was an accident, that's all it and was. And we were never better or bothered at her because again, accidents happen and that's see, right. what we're talking about here tonight is how that you can love God and serve God and things traumatic mm -hmm and tragedies come, and when they come, you have to decide during that tragedy whether you're going to panic, you're going to give in to fear, you're going to give in to confusion, you're going to give in to emotion. And we have both had emotions. Very uh, much so. I mean, you know, here she is lying in the police car with our daughter's head in her lap. She's told me this story many times and just pouring with blood. and and. Uh, uh, this 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 horrible accident taking place. I'm not there with her, and and she's having to go through these moments by herself. But she, you weren't by yourself no. because you I had, had the comfort of the Holy Spirit, uh, you know, with me, and I really did feel their presence because it's like, well, I can't go in shock. I can't faint. Here is my daughter. And Holy Spirit, you have to help me get through this. And he did. Well, we, we walked through this thing together. And that's one thing that's important is 
if you're single, you need to find you someone, someone that you can pray in agreement with and mm -hmm. get on the same page that right. you're your own. And that's one of the things that we were able to do because number one, we, we loved each other, we believed in each other, and you know, we were in the ministry because God called us and we weren't in the ministry to to make a name or a reputation or any of those things. God called us into the ministry and that's why that we were doing what we're doing. I just want to stop a minute and say to you that's um, uh, saying some stuff and I just saw Audrey here just a few minutes ago and every now and then Audrey thank you for watching. Uh, I saw Carolyn there again but Audrey used to live across the street from us when I was growing up and she was growing up and uh, uh, thank you Audrey for watching and being a part but as, as Sharon was going through this before I could get home we walked through this together we stood together we prayed together oh, and we yeah. believed God together and God brought us through this and and as, as, as you said several years passed and we had a setback mm -hmm. And we were actually traveling from Chattanooga to California when this happened. And, um, and you know, um, it was a setback after several years. And the devil said yes. to me, too, mm -hmm. you know, this reminded me of what the neurosurgeon, the devil reminded me of what the neurosurgeon had told us. And, um, but, you know, as we both said, we just got an agreement. We, mm -hmm. we were in prayer. Actually, she was on her way with the rest of our children to California. Yeah. We were in Phoenix when, it, when they were yeah. going to meet us in California. So we actually had to leave Phoenix and fly to and Dallas. And fly back to Dallas because of the incident. Yeah, because they stopped in Dallas when she yeah. had this incident. Actually, and, you know, what she did, uh, she was on the plane and she had a seizure a very strong seizure on the plane and just so happened there was a doctor on the plane and they made the plane was en route to Phoenix but they made it stop in Dallas. They're done way to California. Or, yeah to California and they made it stop in uh, Dallas uh, to get her off to get her to the hospital and you know when when we got the call from our uh, son said Tammy's had a seizure we're in Dallas we're not in California you you guys are gonna have to come here because they they took her to the hospital and so right away you know the devil says see I told you and but we had to put that thought down and say no Satan you are a liar she is healed this is a setback and she is coming out of this and she's never had another one since then Never, never, never. God just totally did that. But see, it was the devil trying to bring a setback. And mm -hmm. that's what, that, I think many times when people see something that doesn't completely meet all of their expectations in that particular area like we're talking about, yes. they can allow the enemy to get them into fear again and panic and say nothing, it didn't, it, this is not done, this is not finished, but well, sure. we knew that it was finished. We, we knew, knew it, it was, was finished. Done. It was, uh, uh, God doesn't halfway do things. Well, and we knew she was totally healed. Well, she is a blessing today. She and is. She's, she's a, a, a She's an army wife. She's an army <laughs> wife. Her husband's still deployed uh, out on a mission for the United States of America. He's been in the, the army now for, well, when he gets home, it's going to be 20 years, and, mm -hmm. and I think he's going to retire. We're hoping that maybe he'll retire from the <laughs> Army uh, when he gets home. But anyway, you know, that's his fourth deployment. Yeah. But she's got a beautiful son, a grandson. He is just absolutely beautiful. And um, um, we just have learned that we can't fear in this journey. You know, as I started out talking, this is a journey, and when you start out and you make commitments, now, folks, listen to me. Mm -hmm. We had no idea when we started on this journey. Uh, we was poor. We didn't have anything. And we started out on this journey together. She didn't know what she was getting into <laughs> when she married me. Uh, I mean, you know, she didn't know what the ministry was like. Um, 
and I didn't know a lot what it was like because I was just 19 years of age and I'd been in there in the ministry since I was 15. But you know, I'd really just just started to, to get some breaks and God opened some doors for me. But uh, when this happened, you know, our ministry had progressed and we, we had four children by this time. And um, <clears throat> our ministry had grown when this happened and we'd seen a lot of things happen and take place in the the success of ministry but you know not too long after that a few years after that uh, actually it's in 1982 and I know this goes back a number of years but our son Jeffrey his name was Terry Jeffrey and as he got we used to call him Terry but when he got a little older he wanted to be called Jeff <laughs> so on a Monday or Tuesday it was after Memorial Day uh, the night before he and I had gone, and uh, I, I had this little Datsun 280ZX, 280ZX and had the T-tops on it. So I drove to Alabama, and I was doing a ministry thing there. Well, I didn't drive. He said, he just got his learner's permit, and he said, Dad, can I drive you? And I said, yes, and so I did. And he loved Phil Driscoll, and so we had a cassette, and he played Phil Driscoll all the way, so loud. You know, here I was going to minister, but um, he was enjoying himself so much, I just let him have a good time. So when we got there, he said, Dad, would you, would you trust me enough to let me get one of my cousins to go with me that's got driver's license, let me drive back and forth down the strip and take the tees off, take the tops off. And he said, I promise I'll be back before it's over. And he was a good kid. He was really a good kid. So he, um, he took the, we took the tops off and he got one of my cousins in there and they drove back and forth and had a good time and then after the meeting he drove me back home again listening to Phil Driscoll and um, he was a talker. He was a talker. He was a talker and he just kept wanting to talk. He was a lot I'm, like you. Oh. <laughs> 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 oh. <laughs> <laughs> he oh. was his daddy's son. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was. But anyway, uh, I was trying to get some sleep, but he wanted to talk and listen to Phil Driscoll at the same time. But anyway, the next day was a very sad day. Um, we were getting ready to do the big conference downtown in Chattanooga every year. We called, um, we, we had what I call Chattanooga for Jesus, and we brought in these speakers. Um, and we would do this, I think, five or six nights mm -hmm. with a different speaker every yeah. night. And um, a lot of these people, if I called their name, you'd know each one that we would have come in. And um, this was right before the convention. And from the platform to, to the uh, sound booth, they have this big cord that's called a snake because there's a lot of cords in it, but they call it a snake. And um, so he, after lunch, he and I had had lunch together on that Tuesday morning after the Monday, mon Monday night. And so um, he said, Dad, can I go under the platform and see what it's going to take to get the snake out? So we're just going to take it down to the big auditorium. So I said, yes. And so when he went to look and see what it would take, um, there had been air conditions installed in our building and the person that installed them didn't ground the air conditions. So when, when that happens and something goes wrong, instead of it kicking a breaker, it put all the power on the, uh, on the, on the, the ducts the that duct carried work. the air. So under the platform was um, ducts and so when he went under there, he touched those ducts and he was immediately electrocuted. And we didn't find him for a while um, because I was busy in a meeting and she was busy doing some things in the ministry. And so after a while I got to looking for him and we couldn't find him and obviously he was found under the platform. Now, Sharon, what was that, those few moments in the beginning, what was it like? I, I, I can remember at the, at the church when yeah. this happened, but when we got to the hospital and the doctor came out and well, when, you know, in your heart you knew there was no life because, you know, I didn't want to accept it when they dragged him out and I, I literally strang, you know, 
straddled him and was praying, but I knew there was no life left in his body. And, but then, you know, they have to take him to the hospital and pronounce him dead. And uh, when the doctor come out, he uh, confirmed that he, he was dead. There was no life left in his body. And for an instant, it seemed like it was a long time, but it was just a few seconds. I felt myself kind of drifting because of the shock, um, because I loved him so much. And um, I heard you calling to me, Sharon, Sharon, but it's like I didn't want to. I was aware, but I didn't want to because I was still shocked that I was no longer going to have my son. And so while we were in the elevator, I remember you and you finally shook me. And, um, but then, you know, I gained my composure and uh, knew that we had to deal with reality. And it's like, you know, when you're faced with that, well, what do you do next? What about the procedure for the funeral, the showing? You know, all these things started going through my mind and I just was overwhelmed with it. And um, so all, all we could do is just say, God, you're gonna have to help us through this. And so one of our dear friends, you know, he, we didn't have a plot, we didn't have anything, except something we didn't prepare for that we were gonna lose our son. Because you know, it's, it's, it's natural that your parents go on, but you don't plan for your children to go first. And so we had a lot of support when this happened. Um, our elder of the church took care of the plot for us. And then, you know, my mind as I knew what we were going to be talking about tonight. And um, my mind still, go, <clears throat> still goes back to one of the elders in our church. Great big burly guy, uh, just huge, tall. And he, he <clears throat> wasn't a man of a lot of words, but he was a loving man. And uh, I just buried myself in him and cried. And he didn't say a word, uh, but he just let me cry and uh, kind of got over some of the emotion. And then by that time, others were coming to the house. And then I just dreaded uh, the thoughts of telling our children uh, about the, uh, the incident. Uh, but we had so much support from other people to help us get through the death of our son. And the pain was just um, so deep. It was much deeper. You know, here it is, I thought about my daughter and then all these thoughts go through your head when something like that happens. And you think, well, I'm just being honest. When you think, well, what if it had been this child? No, I wouldn't want to give up that child either. And you think, well, what if it had been this one? No, I couldn't because I love my children so much. So any child, I would have felt devastated. And so one of the things when death happens to a loved one like this, you go through a period of grief. And, but what, is dangerous is when you let the grief become a, a spirit of grief. And that's the key to the victory over grief of losing a loved one. And two things, one, one helps the grieving person in a past, in time, things will kind of come in focus. But secondly, if you allow the spirit of grief to take hold of you, then it, can t it grabs your whole life and the people around you, you can no longer help the people around you when that spirit of grief sets in. So we can't allow the spirit of depression when we lose a loved one. In Psalms 35, it says, weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes in the morning. And you say, well, how could you possibly have joy in the morning when you're crying all night? But when you're crying and praying at night, a new day arises and your faith in God, you have to believe that he's gonna help you through the day so that you can have the joy to go through that day. And if you, 
and I'm not saying it, it's easy because it's not. And do I still hurt? Yes, I still hurt. But time has passed. And so you are able then to deal with it as time goes on. And uh, some of, the, of what uh, sets in too is anger. You want to blame yourself if this, if that. Because I can still very vividly patch, see that very morning that he was going to the office with them. And he was tired with from us. the trip. And he was laying in bed. And I thought, oh, maybe I should just let him stay home today. And so when the incident happened, you kind of go back over and relive moments if, if only, if I had of. But you see, that's what the devil wants. He wants to beat us up with guilt and regret or saying, if you had of. And we've all been there where we said, if I only, if only. And uh, he wants to put guilt on you. And I, I go back to that morning, if only, you know, there at the beginning, if only I would have let him slept, I would have had my son. But you know what? You can't go back in time. What is, is, and what happened, happened. And so I can't spend the rest of my life in guilt and say, well, if you would have left him in bed, you would have had your son. I don't have that guarantee that I would have had my son if I left him in bed. And uh, so, you know, uh, in John 10:10, 10, 10, it says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy, but I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. And even after as horrific as this was, as losing our beloved son, I can still have life to the full. Did it happen overnight? Absolutely not. Did it happen in a week? Absolutely not. Did it happen in a month? Absolutely not. But there was a time of grieving that I had to allow myself, especially I birthed him and carried him for nine months. So I had to allow myself to go through the grieving process. And uh, some, you know, it was good to have people around that were encouraging and um, some of the things some of our friends even that this happened to um, they get angry with God well you see I was never angry with God and that's big not being angry with God because God didn't cause it you say well how do you know I know God didn't cause it because I serve a good good father and he didn't take my son by this horrific accident but uh, I never had uh, angry feelings toward God. And the only satisfaction that helped me over the grief was I would put music on in worship songs. And because I was hurting so badly, I really, in my mind, I really couldn't find the words in English to say to the Lord, and I didn't want to hear you preach as good a preacher as you are. I didn't want to hear preaching. Um, I couldn't read my Bible and I couldn't even pray. You say, but Pastor Sharon, you couldn't pray? No, I couldn't pray in English. And uh, I prayed in the spirit, but my healing came is when I would listen to praise and worship. It's like, it's hard to explain, but it's like oil that just dripped on the inside of me and I would feel this peace of relief so that I can praise my heavenly father. And it's like, even though I couldn't find the words in English, it's like our worship leader, every song that he would sing would be the words that I wanted to send up to my heavenly father because I was hurting so bad and I knew he wanted to heal me in time and he allowed me this time to grieve. But the dangerous part is, is when you stay in your grief and let that spirit of grief take you over. And um, we all know it in the scriptures in Hebrews 9, 27, it says it's appointed unto man once to die, but you don't think about your children dying before you do. And I certainly didn't think of our beautiful Jeff dying before we do, but you know what? Um, God's grace uh, took me through the pain of that and brought me out where 
every day, every year, do I still think about him? Well, of course I do. And do I still hurt? Yes, but not as badly. Um, the memory doesn't hurt like a dagger in my heart like it used to. Do I miss him? I miss him every day. And uh, um, two weeks ago was his anniversary. Uh, actually, 12 days ago uh, of his uh, going home. And uh, we talk about it, but we don't talk about it a lot. Um, but you know, um, I looked up the word of uh, death or bereavement today. And bereavement actually means to be deprived by death. I'm deprived on this earth by my beautiful son. But you know what? Uh, I know I'll see him again. And that's what brought me through because I know I'll see him again. And uh, you may want to take over from here till I gain a little bit of composure. <laughs> Well, it's hard to pick up right now at the moment and go on with this because this is a real story that we lived. And as I said at the beginning of the program, some of you were with us, some of you probably were not. And I said, we started out on a journey. We started out on a journey to love each other, to love God, to love each other, to minister to people. And so there's no way we knew what the journey would entail but in the journey, we never lost our joy. We never lost Jesus. We never lost our love for God. We never let ministry become something we do just because we do it. But we let ministry, we just let ministry uh, take its natural place and we love God. But we had to bring, we still ministered to people through our hearts and through our pains, and we still do. And. Um, the grief that she was talking about, I think a lot of people don't really know how to grieve and then let God help you through the grief, as she said. I often say continual grieving is holding on to what you no longer have. Mm -hmm. I want to say it again, continual grieving is holding on to what you no longer have. We no longer have our son Jeffrey. He's in heaven. So we have him in the heaven and we know we will meet him again and be with him again. Was I hurt in all of this? Of course. Uh, did, I, did I go through a lot of things? Yes, I went through a lot of things. And You know, you're, when you're going through um, the loss of a loved one, especially um, a child, we've lost our parents, but the pain was so much deeper when we lost our son. And, um, but, uh, Every day, we had each other to console, but uh, every day, and you know, um, as, as time went on, and um, I remember our, having our first grandchild, uh, Chad. Um, I think that's one reason why I love that boy so much. Uh, I always say, God, you smiled and you gave me another son. And uh, um, I love, Chad so much because it seemed like there was a hole in me and I didn't have anybody to love on uh, to take the place of Jeff and uh, actually Chad is named after Jeff and uh, uh, so Jeff, close. Jeff, his name is Jeffrey his Chad. His name is Jeffrey Chad and uh, I, in the scripture uh, Psalms 42 1 through 5 it says as the deer pants for streams of water so my soul pants for you my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Where can I go and meet with God? My tears have been my fond day and night, while people say to me all day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the mighty one, with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope, this is what I want to get to. Put your hope in God, for I will praise him, my Savior and my God. And 
putting your hope in God is the only comfort that I received. Nothing else around me gave me comfort like putting my hope in God because I knew I would see him one day. And, you know, as I said, songs were what brought me through because I didn't know the words in English because I was hurting so bad. But we sing a song here at our congregation. He's a chain breaker. And the songs, uh, the words of it came to me again today when I knew what we we're going to be talking about. And it's so true. If you've got pain, he's a pain taker. And he can take your pain away. And if you feel lost, he is a way maker. If you need freedom or saving, he's a prison shaken savior. If you've got chains, he's a chain breaker. And if you are chained today from things, hurts from the past, or hurt from a loved one from the past, realize today that you can break free. Not, I'm not saying you'll never have moments, uh, just like I had a moment here a while ago. I'm not saying you'll be free from moments, but your moments get better because Jesus makes a way for you. And uh, just a word, uh, if you are there and you know someone that has gone through something, something that used to really hurt, just a word of encouragement, never tell that person you know what they're going through because you don't know what they're going through. And that only adds to the pain. In fact, it almost makes you angry when a person says, I know what you're going through. Just love them like I was telling you about our elder at our church in Tennessee. I can still picture him. I still picture him embracing me with his big old burly arms. And he just let me cry. He didn't say a word. And then his wife, his, I'll never forget Linda as well, all she would do is hug me and pray in the spirit because, you know, really what words of comfort can you give someone other than praying in the Holy Spirit or just let them cry? And uh, so that, that was uh, just a word of wisdom to you. Uh, when you have a friend or a loved one that is going through the loss of a loved one, unless you really have been through it. And then even though I have been through it, you know, I'll never forget uh, a few years ago, I had the uh, privilege of ministering to a lady that lost all four of her children due to a drowning at one time. And um, they had, uh, we were there in a meeting and they, she said she wanted to talk with me. And so I shared some things with her and I said, you can't ever hold on to guilt and saying, what if, what if, because it will just literally drive you crazy and you will never get over the grief. And I had the privilege of ministering to that lady and uh, I saw her uh, when we came back to that city about a year later and she came up to me and she said, thank you, thank you, thank you. You set me free because I wouldn't even allow myself to be happy when I had those moments of happiness. She said, I was overwhelmed <clears throat> with guilt. She said, but I remember the words that you spoke to me in some very private words. And she said, you helped me so much to get through the loss. Well, what you just said, you said several things there that I want to take just a minute here to mention and we're going to try to come to an end real quick. But two things, if we both had to get through this and when you lose a loved one, mm -hmm. if I had have done this or if I hadn't have, that's wasted, you're wasting your life. That's right. When you say what if, I, or if I hadn't, or if I had. The Lord really helped us through this, and I've shared many times there was a great man of God, T.O. Osborne, who was, happened to be a great friend of ours that helped us through this uh, whole situation. And by the way, our grandson Chad is watching. Aww. <laughs> I had no idea he was watching Chad, and he said, love y'all, and we love you too, Chad. But the, what if? Don't do that. And then she talked about, I understand what, I know what you're going through. You know, that's, a, or people will say, I know how you feel. 
You know, we've lost our loved one, our son, and I have probably ministered at, I've probably done a thousand or more funerals in my life. I don't know, some preachers keep up with it, but I never kept up with the funerals and the weddings that I did. I guess it would have been a good thing if I had them, but I never at a funeral or the loss of anyone that I've been around, I never said to someone, I know how you feel, because I don't know how you feel. I don't know what you're going through. I know pain, and so I'll tell people I understand pain. We I can understand identify loss. with the pain. Yes, I understand pain. I understand loss, and so if you tell someone and you want to, you have been through it and you want to identify. Don't say I I know how you feel or I, I understand. Uh, just say I understand pain, and and as she said, uh, this this gentleman she was talking about, he was such a great friend, he and his wife, and, and he was tall and, and, and very loving and very kind. And, and I remember he was a man of few words, but uh, he never tried to tell us anything other than I'm here and let us know that. So loving people in their most trying moments is the best thing you can do instead of the, and, unless they want words of wisdom, and if you've got words mm -hmm. of wisdom, then use yeah. those. But, Holding on to grief is the next thing that I already mentioned. Somewhere you got to let go of the grief. You know, your mother, I got to say this yeah. real quickly. Your brother, your brother was 20 years. It was on his birthday, on his, his 20th, 20th birthday. birthday. He was attending Buffalo University and they lived in Canada. Sharon's mother, she had already been married to me at the time. And um, her brother, was driving home from Buffalo University and he had the two doors down was mm -hmm. the three doors down three doors down was his uh, friend and they were riding back and forth from Buffalo New York to Niagara Falls Ontario Canada and it was in the winter and a drunk driver hit him and killed them both and her mother was mm -hmm. waiting at home for him to come home and had a surprise birthday party waiting for him could you imagine what she went through mm -hmm. Uh, now this happened before our son was killed and um, your mother grieved so badly yeah your mother grieved so badly she had three other children mm -hmm. like we did but she grieved so badly in that first year she aged 10 years mm -hmm. and I remember after the first year sin I would not been through this but I took her by the shoulders and I looked her in the eye and I said to her you've got to stop grieving and I got her attention and we prayed for her. and from that moment mm -hmm. the Holy Spirit helped her to snap out of that and when she snapped out of that her life began to come oh, back. She, yeah she became a different person um, joy started coming back in her life and she started enjoying life and uh, like us you know you, you they're always the thoughts always with you um, and you know, one thing that you know, as your as our other children matured, and they got married and had children. You your mind kind of wanders and say, well, I wonder what kind of wife he would have chosen, what his children would have looked like. But you know, you can't stay there because uh, you, time has moved on, and he is no longer with us. So those those are kind of wasted, and they will. You know, even though it's as long as it's been, if you dwell on thoughts like that, it can still bring you down because you think about the loss. You don't think about the life you have right now. And you don't think about one day, hey, all those wasted thoughts, I'm going to see them in heaven anyway. And there's, I, I say, there's uh, nothing on this earth that's going to make me miss out going to heaven because I've got a, a purpose not only to see my son, but I've got a purpose to see my heavenly father because I've got a few bones to pick with him. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's, uh, uh, it's all good. It's all good. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a day by day walk when you come through tragedy and, and the loss of a loved one. Well, it's a journey. It is. See, it's a journey and, and this and, is what- You know, one thing too, hun that uh, a lot of people aren't prepared for 
everything is going fine. You're, you get back to a normal life as quickly as you can and you'll be riding down the road or you'll be in a crowd and all of a sudden you're overwhelmed and this grief wants to hit you and it, it almost captivates you and wants to take you away but you can't give in to that and little things like that will trigger uh, of you wanting to cry or get back into the grief but don't, don't just don't let it linger because it will bring you back down. Well, just the other night, I mean, this is, she said it's been a long time, but just the other night I was lying on my bed and she just mentioned a few minutes ago, we just had an anniversary, June the 1st was an anniversary of his going home. And it was somewhere around the, the 1st or the 2nd or the uh, end of May, I was lying on the bed and all at once I had a flashback of of what happened that day with our son and I, I, I could still had to deal with I still had as mm -hmm. long as it's been right. I still had to deal with if I hadn't have allowed him to do this yeah but again we we didn't do that and then one of the things that she mentioned too is Sometimes after you're going on with your life and you're, you're taking the Word of God and you're getting better, you start feeling good moments and happy moments and then all at once guilt will come mm -hmm. on you because you're allowing yourself to get better, to get over it and to go on. And so you, then you've got to deal with guilt when the guilt comes because you're, 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 you're like you're saying, well, you're just putting them away. No, they're already gone and yeah. you can't bring them back. So we came to a place of triumph. Now, these are just two incidents of tragedies that we've been through in the ministry and serving God and being husband and wife. There's been many things that has happened that we don't have time to discuss and go and we're already over time here. But no matter what your tragedy, your problem, your heartaches, your, your, your suffering that you're going through. You know, it could be um, your grandchildren, it could be a husband, it could be, I don't know what it is, but I just feel tonight that you can't live inward. You gotta let that out and you gotta let Jesus take your hand and learn to be a giver. See, if you're not a giver, you're hurting yourself. You're not hurting the church. You're not hurting the ministry. You're not hurting somebody else. But when you're not a giver, I just got to bring that back because all this goes hand in hand. You've got to learn to be a giver because if you hold on to what you have, you're not opening the door for something new to come in. Mm -hmm. And that's what grief does. That's right, it does. See, grief, grief closes the door to where you can't get free. You can't get healed. It keeps you captive. It keeps you captive. And so I just want to encourage you, if you've lost a loved one, as, as we've talked about losing our son and, and Sharon has gone through these steps of what partially, I mean, how mm -hmm. can you do this in yeah. just a few minutes? It takes much longer. You know, and something else too uh, that kind of just brought to my mind, you know, somebody may have lost a home, they may have lost their job, they may have lost their way in life and uh, they can come back if they will just trust God. And, you know, they may have lost their business. I know um, uh, Pastor Jan had talked about um, them, someone taking their business from them. And that wasn't easy to overcome that loss of the business. And maybe someone has lost their home due to finances or whatever. But you know, if they keep believing God and continue to sow, God will bring them through. Amen. Well, Alicia saying, Grandma and I really enjoy this message tonight. God bless you both. And many of you commented, but it wasn't appropriate for me to acknowledge you because of the subject matter tonight. I felt like that I must continue and allow Sharon to, to talk about what she went through, how God helped her, how God helped us. We're together. So whatever your journey is like, whatever, whatever roadblocks, whatever detours, whatever hindrances, whatever pain, whatever loss has come in your life, 
Don't lose Jesus and don't That's let right. Jesus out of your life and hold on to him. People may do you wrong and people may disappoint you, but God never does you wrong and God will never disappoint you. So, Sharon, do you want to pray or you want me to pray? You go ahead and pray, but I do want to just reiterate, if you've got pain, Jesus Christ is the pain taker. And that words to that song is so true. It's just like Jesus took a lot of our pain away. Do we still deal with it? Yes, but it doesn't hurt like it used to. And so if you will turn your life over to him and then turn it completely over to him, he will take it away from you and make your life a lot better and give you the grace to continue on in life. Well, we're going to pray and thank all of you that have stayed with us and have been with us, you that will view this sometime later. I just hope that somehow our realness, Susan Patterson up in uh, Newark, mm -hmm. Ohio, I've been our friend for many years. She said, I appreciate you being so real. Well, Susan, really, that's all Sharon and me know how to be. <laughs> we, we are not one thing in church and then someone else when we're home. We're just, we're just who we are. We just love God. We just love God. And that's what's kept our marriage together. Mm -hmm. That's what's kept us is because we love God and it's not about being a minister. It's about loving God and serving God. And in this journey, many things have happened as I said, but when these things happen, we always look to our source. God is our source. No, no one person is our source. God is our source and he'll be yours. Father, I thank you for the people that have watched on all the different apps that we're on, whether it's Cross TV or whether it's Roku or whether it's uh, Lightcast, whether it's Android or uh, Facebook, Periscope, whatever they're watching, on what by what means. Wherever they are in the world, God, you're bigger than their need. You're bigger than their problem. You've taken us through pain. You've taken us through loss. And we're sitting here today after these tragedies have happened. And we love you as much now, or possibly more, that we've been through these traumatic events. So Lord, we just thank you that you have given us the strength. You've given us the peace. You've given us the joy, the courage to walk through. Now, whoever it is right now that's hurting, that's in pain or in loss, help them to see greater is he that's within you than he that's within the world. And somehow they'll reach out in faith and not continue to grieve, not continue to ask questions and not continue to blame and not continue to be angry, not continue to, to say things that have no uh, way of bringing health and healing to them, but help them to speak your word and to speak life and not death. So right now in the name of Jesus, I release the anointing of the Holy Spirit to you right now. I release the anointing of the Holy Spirit to you right now for your complete healing and your deliverance, for you to let go of the pain, the grief, the sorrow. Jesus carried your sorrow, your griefs, and your pains. So you're healed and delivered right now. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Well, Sharon, thank you for being here with me. You know, to get her here, that's quite a... <laughs> Quite a, I can't remember her ever doing this with me. Maybe one time she might have, but uh, getting her to do this. And as she said, uh, she's normally watching our great-granddaughter on Tuesday nights. And so she can't um, uh, be here, but she, our great-granddaughter's off uh, for school right now. And so uh, uh, this is possible for her to be here. So well, thank been, you for watching. It's been good. And I just believe someone out there was touched and know that they can go on after loss. Amen. Yes, you can. You can go on. Well, God bless you. Oh, I want to remind you of this Sunday service. This Sunday, and we're, we're, we're going to go into um, our uh, Experience Life Church. We were going to talk about this, but here's why one of the reasons we're talking about this is 
We have experienced life, and we want to share with other people how you can experience, and no matter what you've experienced, God will. Our great-granddaughter is off uh, for school right now, and so uh, uh, this is possible for her to be here. So well, thank been, you for watching. It's been good, and I just believe someone out there was touched and know that they can go on after loss. Amen. Yes, you can. You can go on. Well, God bless you. Oh, I want to remind you of this Sunday service. This Sunday, and we're, we're, we're going to go into um, our uh, Experience Life Church. We were going to talk about this, but here's why one of the reasons we're talking about this is we have experienced life, and we want to share with other people how you can experience, and no matter what you've experienced, God will heal you everywhere you hurt. Well, God bless you. I will see you, and I hope you'll tune in Sunday at 10.35 a.m. Central Daylight Time, right here from where we are right now. God bless you, and I hope to see you again soon.